This is Off the Break Podcast, presented by Silver Screen Insider. Welcome to the next edition of the Off the Break Podcast, your podcast dedicated to current movie theater news, operations, and insights from the people that book the movies. I'm Ken, and with me as always are Cody and Kyle. Hello. Hello. Great to be back. Yes, another week. Uh, we woke up to snow, people. It's May. Yeah. It's the middle of May. We woke up to snow. We had 80 degree weather. Summer was kicking in. Like two days ago. Yeah. And then Montana's actual summer hit. Yeah. And that, a foot of snow came. It was false, <laughs> false spring, like gotcha spring. And now yeah. we're back to winter. Well, you two idiots are here by choice. <laughs> <laughs> I no. met somebody and got stuck here. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're the one that's here by choice. I got roots, baby. <laughs> Uh, this isn't the first time it snowed in May, and it's not. The, it won't be the last. No, it, no, it won't no, be the last time it snows this year. To be honest, we're, we're <laughs> right. complaining about it. We got at least one or two more of these in us. Just and, wait till Fourth of July when everyone wants to be out sidelining oh fireworks, and then it snows. My yeah. my first year out here, it snowed. 18 inches on June 12th, which is my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> I got yeah. moved out here in March. <laughs> in June, it snowed 18 inches. Yep. <laughs> Poor so, guy. So I'm not I'm not new to this, but it doesn't make it hurt any less. <laughs> yeah, I was pretty disappointed. I think I'm just so ready to be out. I, I think it's being cooped up from the last year. Yeah. And this summer it's just I really want to be outside and I really want to be in the sunshine and then and it snows. And it's spring and we're finally hitting like major releases and yeah. it's like things so are changing things. and then it's the movie snow. season. And mm-hmm. then there's going to be the next. Well, I mean that <laughs> the next virus is coming around too. Apparently, <laughs> don't say that. Too bad there's Don't not a, ma- a major release this weekend because what else are you going to do? It's not enough snow to ski on. <laughs> it's not enough snow to sled on, but it's just enough snow to make the roads icy. So, just go to the movie theater. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds perfect to me. Yeah. Well, on today's podcast, we've got our normal lineup. We're going to talk about some you know, release schedule stuff, some booking strategies, a couple articles about uh, media mergers, and then we'll get into some trailers. And Kyle will give us all of the good on Spiral and Those Who Wish Me Dead, because he's been going to the theater. Yeah, I've been coming back. I'm starting to become a regular again. Yeah, and then we'll end it with a really fun theater horror story. (laughs) This one's pretty good. This one is good. So, um, anything for upcoming release changes, uh, you have here, Dune has not been set for theatrical exclusively. Yeah. So there was a report that happened over the past weekend where it was sounding like Dune was officially set to be a theater only release and not a day and day release, but then Warner Bros. quickly, um, shut that um stuff down and was saying that no it is right now day and date but um i wouldn't be shocked if those conversations between them and legendary are still going on Mm -hmm. when it comes to their release strategy for this movie but there was just a false alarm when it came to that so bummer um but really that was the only big release thing that i thought it was worth mentioning otherwise it's kind of like last week where it's a bunch of smaller titles um getting released and then not a whole lot of big movies are getting pushed back at all so uh another week kind of of clear sailing no oh, we have submitted dates for all the films in june so Good. very nice yeah we're on it like yeah. and universal seems very set on uh spirit untamed and f9 i mean we're those are going to be two anchors right there. and With theatrical release windows. Yeah. <laughs> Warners has kept their In the Heights and Conjuring dates where they're at. so Without the theatrical release windows. Oh, Yay. Boo. boo. <laughs> yeah. Well, it seems like for the titles in June, it doesn't look that bad. I mean, mm-hmm. In the Heights is already getting great reviews just today. Um, F9 opened in China and it made $59 million, I believe. So that's... Yeah, it, it seems like a good opening number right. anyway. Yeah, that seems amazing. I just wish it would open day and day around the world, <laughs> not just sure. in China yeah. right now. We got Peter Rabbit with the theatrical window. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hitman's Wife's and- Bodyguard's Best Friend's Neighbor. <laughs> <laughs> theatrical window. Yeah. 
So I, we've got more theatrical windows than not. I know that yes. Sony is working on the print plant still for that. So if you are a smaller theater, say a twin or a three, bombard them. Bombard them with requests. <laughs> we need this film everywhere that we can get it. We re- will need a refresh on the kids product and put, you know, just bombard them with your requests. Because I think the more pressure that we put out, the more that we push for it, they'll, they'll, widen out that print plan a little bit it's so weird movie theaters want movies <laughs> i know. would have thought or, and then there's more theaters open now like that's and we want crazy. pg family movies so yes. weird shocking so oh, weird. we don't want three weeks of rated r titles <laughs> but that seems like what everybody's going out to see yeah. four straight weeks of rated r only releases yeah. <laughs> this has been a little rough <laughs> Or a movie called Profile from Focus. <laughs> That's all we've had. Is that Profile rated R? I thought it was PG-13. Oh. It, 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 take your pick. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. <laughs> it wasn't, it, no it falls in the it. same line. Yeah. <laughs> so as far as booking strategies, I have people, a brand new struggle that's happening. And it's it's going to continue to happen as the months go on. But I am faced with the dilemma. Um, do I support the small distributors that have been with us through the, all the pandemic who are still putting out product or do I support the big guys now that they're back? Like it is, I don't have enough screens to go around and I don't know now where my loyalties lie and that's becoming a challenge. Like I don't want to ice out the small guys that were putting out product in the pandemic when we desperately needed it. I also don't want to miss out on the big guys who have national marketing campaigns. It's its not a clear-cut decision, and it's its getting more challenging now. Now that we're getting into June and there's a major release each week, I i don't know. I don't have all the screens to support all my, all my small distributors, and it's getting a little tough. I think it's pretty cut and dry. Is uh, Vin Diesel doing any small independent films this summer? No. <laughs> then <laughs> Universal and Fast 9 it is. Well, it's not... Those obviously they're oh is IFC releasing a second uh, franchise movie with an animated rabbit? <laughs> no, there's obvious okay. there's obviously anchor films, but it's but the question comes like how long do I hold something? Do I bring a small distributor in and maybe cut off a run of something a little short? I mean, those are the things I'm coming Ble- at. Bleecker Street have LeBron James starring in any <laughs> franchise films? That involve an animated rabbit? <laughs> that, Im- that involve anything with LeBron James involved? Er, sorry. <laughs> this, uh, this industry is built on relationships, though, and those guys were is, there with yeah. us, and I don't want to cut that off. And I don't want to turn around and be like, well, thanks, but no thanks. Oh, relationships. Would you rather be in a relationship with... Uh, some actress with an accent you've never heard of or Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> ding, I, ding, ding. We have a winner. I mean, another thing to keep in mind, too, is that these smaller titles also most likely are going day and date as well. Like a lot of them do yeah, have. But some the big ones really are, too. BOD. So, <laughs> well, I'm just saying, like, it's all going to be in the same boat no matter right. what. It's not like you have to choose sides. They're all doing the same thing anyway. Just one of them happens to have, you know bigger marketing teams bigger names attached to them marketing more animation teams. <laughs> not bigger ones they actually exist have actual marketing <laughs> fair i'm enough. just saying that i'm running into an issue where i want to support these guys i want to you find screens for them and it's just becoming more difficult and it's this is where the struggle as a buyer, you're trying not to put too much of your personal preference into things. And that's not just preference yeah. for what kind of movies you like. It's preference for relationships. And I try to be as fair as possible. And it's just, it's just getting hard. I'm trying, you know, it's a cutthroat business, Cody. Yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> if it was easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> Someone's going to get hurt. That's why you're tough. And that's why you listen to this podcast. <laughs> yeah. I'm so tough. I don't know. I mean, even these smaller independent studios must have known what was going to happen once this pandemic subsided. Like I'm yeah. sure they tried to take advantage of the market. Not, I mean, maybe take advantage isn't the right word, but they were trying to be helpful to the theaters and they were trying to capitalize on, you know, so much open space for them to be able to have their movies be able to be played at in theaters. But it didn't, I am mean, now that things are coming back to normal and they weren't able to capitalize quite as much as they probably were supposed to, you know, these bigger yeah. guys are going to come in and the bigger just guys have the movies that people make, will want over the smaller ones. It's making me sad a little bit on just an ethical 
maybe existential level because you know those big studios they could have been releasing films in the pandemic they have an arsenal of movies they they could have helped us out more and they didn't and then Mm -hmm. the little guys did and they stepped up and they found an opening and they took the opportunity and you and now that we're back it's just who do I want to reward more I really want to reward the little guys for their loyalty and their and their help and their support but and I, and I want to punish the big guys a little bit for kind of giving us the cold shoulder and abandoning us on the release schedule but at the same time I always got to do what's best for the client I always got to do what will fill the butts and seats what will put people in that theater I'm just like to talk out the the internal struggle I have sometimes with that because it is sure. a industry based on relationships and loyalty and you know I and I think that that's what makes our industry unique and I, that's one of the parts I really like about it is that we are kind of a small knit community you talk to the same people and they may move around but you those relationships stay and Oh, I'm just having a hard time because I can't, I can't support them like as much as I w- would want to. Business is founded on relationships, but it's always tough when the business affects a relationship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I so don't, I get I'm it. not worried that that's gonna happen. Is that I'm gonna lose friendships? Or I'm not w- worried about that. I mm. just, it's just I can see it on the horizon. I can see it coming where I'm gonna have to tell somebody no, and I can't accommodate you, and I can't do it this time. Maybe next time, and. Those are just not not fun, especially when they've been supportive of us. So things are returning to normal. Yeah. Oh, great. <laughs> the moral I forgot of the, the story fun is... normal. I don't want that normal back. <laughs> the moral of the story is Fast 9 releases June 25th. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyways, that's what is on the horizon for my booking strategies. Otherwise, it's just booking the anchor movies through the end of the month and then taking a look at the next month and the next month and... Just getting our plans in order. It's really, really up to us. Now, that we got to explore this topic a little bit more, and I've got to do some more research on it and talk to some more people. But on the drive-in side, there is kind of a, a shift happening, a, a strategy shift. And I don't know where it's going or it's gonna f- where things are going to fall, but... I think that there's been this old school kind of booking of classics in the drive-in. They were always cheaper. They were easy to get. And it was kind of lent itself to the experience, the old school experience of going to a drive-in. And you could schedule a whole summer out before you even opened and it was done. Right. But now that we've had a year where a lot of those movies that you would have played during that time got overplayed in the summer and indoors are, are opening back up. Is that the the strategy to do? Should we continue on with that? Because a lot of those films historically have always been kind of DVD and you had to rent them or own them. And so there was still a little bit of a market for that. But now they're such low-hanging fruit. They are on every streaming service that you can imagine. They were like the first things on the streaming service. And with that being free and so easily available, is that going to have the same draw as it used to? Is nostalgia going to win out on these experiences or are they going to have to go first run new content and does the new content bring in the people you know as as much as the old stuff it just it's kind of a weird transition and I'm not sure what where it's going or what's working and that's something you know I want to reach out to more drive-ins and and kind of find out what they're what they're seeing I think I feel like this year is going to be very experimental it's interesting because I, when I think about people and their thoughts on drive-ins, I don't think of them thinking of what movie they're going to see. I'm thinking of them thinking of the drive-in experience. I mean, think back, back to this past year where drive-ins were getting more popular. Mm-hmm. It seemed like, especially with theaters shutting down and, you know, people still could be shut in from everyone, but at least they were in their cars and... You know, if theaters were able to, or if drive-ins were able to make that work, that was great. But it seemed like people were trying to get, were trying to uh, be reinvigorated by the drive-in experience and not by what a movie was playing at. So it, it's, so I, I just didn't think of it in that way too. Is it the movies that people are really going to pay attention close to? Right. 
go and see or is it going to be them just wanting that experience of I think the drive in I think traditionally aesthetic. it was just the experience and that's why you got away with playing <laughs> Twister and um Sand Lot and Bright and um what is that princess bride and sure i think that's why you got away with that now some of that stuff you can't get anymore but now that we've actually used that in that whole all last year is that still the kind of are your is your experience going to be diminished if you go and you're like oh it's jaws again like is that is that a first time experience is that a one-time experience or is that or or are you now are they thinking, hmm, this is COVID safe. I really don't want to be around people anymore. I haven't been around them for the last year. I like to see Black Widow in the drive-in. I don't want to have to go indoors anymore. Yeah, and maybe just because they want that old-fashioned drive-in experience doesn't mean they want an old-fashioned movie to watch with right. it. Like they might still want, as you could probably say this about just about anything these days, but they want the old-fashioned experience of going out, but with something new to see. Yeah. I don't know. Is it, what do you think, Ken? Are we in transitioning or are we are we safe with the old stuff? It just I'm looking at my drive in slate this year and I'm targeting more first drawn stuff and I'm like, is this the way to go? I'm now I'm, I'm questioning it. Well, until the C D C announced that there was a an airborne virus, <laughs> uh drive ins were treated like the third string quarterback. Yeah. They, yeah, they, they sat were. on the bench, they weren't even allowed to hold the clipboard. <laughs> <laughs> they were just kinda like, Oh yeah, that's great. They're open, but it wasn't ever a, a first thought in film companies' minds and now they are the preferred venue in a lot of these locations, which is crazy to think <laughs> after, you know, middling for two decades yeah maybe more i mean there's very few drive-in there were very few drive-ins left in the united states as right. of 2019 yeah and now they've exploded and after having a resurgence in 2020 by playing repertory titles and having dvd bookings and things like that it's it's time to jump into the 21st century like it's it's time for them to not only sell the experience but the films right um i'm trying to encourage all of my locations that are opening to get get on the bandwagon here like if if they can support new movies and create this buzz around new films and a driving experience then you have two different audiences yep not no your nostalgic folks do not want to see quiet place too but that doesn't mean you can't run it with days of freaking thunder yeah. okay <laughs> from paramount it doesn't mean you can't put something out there with it that will appeal to both audiences that's a good way you have strategy to, a good way to go have to i mean yeah it, there's going to be times where we have Black Widow and Cruella, and there's going to be times where we have two Sonys, two Universals. I mean, Spirit and Fast 9 is one of those that we're targeting right. on a grand scale. For 4th of July weekend, yeah. that's kind of, I'm looking at that. You can't do too much better than that without um, Tom Cruise and an F, <sighs> F9 fighter jet. Like, Damn you, Paramount, <laughs> moving that back. So close, so close. You can't do yeah. much better than that. But yeah. It's you have to create multiple experiences for multiple people. It mm-hmm. has to be for families. It has to be for couples. It have to, has to be for people who are nostalgic. I bought a Tasty Freeze here back in 1947. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> like you have to hit all of these different levels. Yeah. But the easiest way to do that is to get new films on the screen and then use the other aspects of your drive-in, whether it's the concessions, whether it's the pre-show entertainment, whatever it is to create the other experiences. But Mm -hmm. you have to promote the films. The Jaws is only going to work so many times. Back to the Future is only going to work so many times, and (laughs) we may have hit that high watermark for those films. That's what I was kind of worried about. I think also the drive-ins only ever had competition from indoors. It was indoors and drive-ins. That's where you could see movies. Now with technology... The way it is and and as accessible as it is, we saw during the pandemic this proliferation. Oh, my God. I cannot talk. Proliferation. Easy for you to say. Thank you, Kyle. Proliferation. Yes. Thanks, guys. (laughs) Of of these pop-up kind of fake drive-ins where they just threw up a blow-up screen and a DVD player and charged people to come out to a cow pasture. I mean, it just... It kind of, I think, diluted the experience of what an authentic, real, traditional drive-in is. And so I'm wondering that now having seen how easy it is, how that techno- technology has made it accessible, and how 
there's a lot of shysters out there just trying to get that, you know, 10 bucks a car yeah. pricing out of it. Um, if, if the authentic drive-ins don't transition away from DVD bookings, away from repertory bookings that anybody can get on a DVD to first run bookings, it gives them a sense of exclusivity in their complex. That's true. Preach girl, preach. Yeah. And, and so I, I'm, I'm weighing that now too. Like the more first runs we play, the more exclusive content we get, then that shows that this is a real drive and this is the experience you want. You don't want to go out and pay 10 bucks for somebody's cow pasture. So I don't know. There's Maybe you a, don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't love the smell of manure. Oh, there's, you know that there's a town out in the Midwest that, you know, people would totally do that for. Uh, and they there was one here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm talking about the one down the street. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> a little hillbilly, little somebody's, uh, I don't know, high school board, you know, I'm going to start a drive-in. Sure, yeah. Great, thanks, guys. <laughs> Way to ruin it for everyone. Yeah. And then everybody's like, this is so great. We're out in our cars. Yeah. Like, you don't even know. We don't have a real drive in here, but you do not know. Yeah, they think they know, but they don't know. Well, it devalues the whole industry. And if you're in indoor theater and you couldn't care less about drive ins, every person that's willing to go to that DVD drive in who doesn't license through a film buyer through the film companies devalues your product as well. Yeah. And every one of those person there that's willing to buy a ticket to uh, Back to the Future is not buying a ticket to Fast 9. Right. <laughs> they're doing that, and they're skipping over you. Yeah. And now not only are you competing with other indoor theaters, streaming services, now you're competing with somebody's field. Yeah. <laughs> with your neighbor in his field. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Those are just a couple of things that have been weighing on my mind as I'm looking you know, at, at this summer now. Now that we're starting to get into product, post-Memorial Day weekend, we're looking at 4th of July, and then we've got Labor Day. And what do we do in between those big holiday weekends? What what am I targeting? What's you know coming out? Do I do the traditional repertory stuff that I've kind of done in the past? Do I do sub run? There's not really even sub run stuff. That's another crazy thing. Because there's no product that really came out before. Sub run was product from, you know, like six to eight weeks previously. But if there was no product or it's not good and it it doesn't have any value in it because of streaming. What do you you, you don't want to bring in? Well, I don't your, know. Your fifty million dollar films from the last eight months yeah. are Tenant, <laughs> yeah, Crudes, Wonder Woman, <laughs> the Christmas. I don't think it, think it get, yeah. got there. Tom and Jerry, Araya, Araya, Godzilla. Rhea. Yeah, maybe Mortal Kombat is almost there. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's like five titles. I mean, we're used to having three every month yeah <laughs> yeah i mean i mean a bad no. opening was like angel has fallen at 40 million maybe that's <laughs> maybe that's kind of what's really prompted my thinking is that i don't have move over titles i don't have stuff that's a little bit old but still has some meat on the bone it's either <laughs> brand new or very old repertory it's just there's not a lot in between and and so now it's getting me thinking like which way do I go? What what do I support? What what will feed that? And it's just so unique to the drive-in because the drive-in is such an experience versus an indoor. And it's such an experience. You have yep. one showtime or you have a double feature showtime. <sighs> yeah, it takes you so late <laughs> to the night. <laughs> yeah, you have. And it depends. I'm learning this too. It depends on what side of a time zone you're on. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're, if you're in Connecticut, you have nailed it as far as time zone works. If you're in Michigan, your first show might not, or your beginning show might not be able to start until 9:45 in the middle of the summer. I mean, I mean, you're talking about people on the East Coast watching a Lakers tip off, yeah, and they have to pay for it and leave their house. <laughs> so it's it's a tough sell, and it's it's really geographically dependent and right because there's seasons up obviously in the north we can't have a drive-in when there's like three inches of snow on the ground in may well i've actually spent a lot of time with people all over the country talking about Mm drive-ins and the seasons you think there would be some more leeway but if it's if it's zero degrees in the northeast nobody's going to a drive-in but if it's 50 degrees in Texas, no one's going to a drive-in either. <laughs> yeah, that's like, true. They don't, they, don't operate <laughs> any di- think about. they don't operate any differently. <laughs> People will sit through a rainstorm if it's nice or, you know, they, they want right. to get out to the movie. But 
if it's cold, it's cold, man. Yeah. <laughs> They're not going out at all. <laughs> oh my gosh, what I wouldn't give for 50 degrees today. <laughs> yeah. It's like so icy out there. I don't think we got above 35 I today. Don't think no, so. no, no. <laughs> it's definitely cold. not. I had to turn on my under desk heater. It's so sad. Yeah, but you do that every day anyway. Not every. I haven't been. It's been 80. I I've haven't. actually not I been haven't. turning that on, be- Kyle. I don't buy it. I don't believe oh, it. Kyle. Speaking of things heating up. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle had some reviews. Yeah, let's get into your reviews, Kyle. Oh, before we do, real quick, I have not heard anything about SVOG. I missed the NATO webinar. I'm not sure what the update is. If anybody has gotten um, a communication from SBA um, about regarding about when they can get their grant, send us an email, let us know. Um, we definitely like to communicate that to everybody, all the listeners out there, but I haven't heard anything. Yeah, okay. lie to us. Just tell us that it's coming. We'll, we'll <laughs> yeah. take that as confirmed Gospel. Evidence. Oh my gosh, it's happening. Hey, this sounds great. <laughs> no follow-up questions. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to send us anything, just put SVOG update in the subject line and we'll guarantee read it. Yeah. What's our, what's our podcast email it's, off the break at? It's off the break podcast at gmail.com. It is Gmail. Okay. Didn't know yeah. if we were weird, like Hotmail or something. I don't know. I wish. I, I would love to have a Hotmail. <laughs> oh. I, I keep, I, why are you like, oh, you I can't get them anymore. I mean, oh, they're it, a rare commodity. I know. I am so proud of my Hotmail email address now. <laughs> Just join Gmail like I'm, the rest of the world. <laughs> I do have a Gmail, but I have a secret Hotmail account. It doesn't account. really matter. Maybe I'm just a snob. You are being a snob. <laughs> Gosh. On the Call poor Hotmails. <laughs> We're going to lose some fans for this. Yeah. Yeah. Showing your age, Kyle. <laughs> Would you two stop screwing okay. around? We got to get serious. That's You're true. right. It's review time. All right. It's review, review time. time. Go ahead. All right. What do you guys want me to review first? Spiral? Yeah. How great both of these were, but Spiral was better than Those Wish Me Dead because it had a theatrical window? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs> Nailed it, Ken. Um, yeah. So Spiral supposed to kind of sort of take place in the Saw franchise universe, I guess. Yeah. Um, it's about uh, a cop that's played by Chris Rock, who's um, the more the more straight cop as compared to his department, who is all filled with crooked cops. And then uh, a jigsaw killer or like a copycat of the jigsaw killer starts to start killing all these other cops. And Chris Rock basically has to find out who the killer is and why the killer is you know yeah. killing all the cops all the dirty cops yeah and i w- this w- i was so close to liking this i thought that this movie was nearly there um because when it comes to the saw franchise i have no interest in it it's just movies that aren't for me they're not my cup of tea but you know with all the stuff that makes saw be as beloved as it is but combine it as like a murder mystery in the vein of seven that sounds intriguing to me like that sounds like that's a really good premise and something that could shake up the franchise but i feel like they didn't quite hit the mark with this movie um the mystery aspect wasn't bad to me i i was able to enjoy it enough but i just think it had a weak script to it and didn't have a director that knew how to direct actors that well (laughs) and you could kind of see that with chris rock who who the guy is trying like at least he was he's doing something different trying to be a dramatic actor Mm -hmm. um but i don't think the role was quite written for his strengths and i don't think the director really helped him as much as the director probably thought that he did so you can just see in in chris rock's performance that he was struggling like a lot throughout the movie he did fine in parts but he was like really struggling for the most part and then the script it it's a bit basic. I mean, it's very weak dialogue. There's a lot of cheesy one-liners from other, you know, detective stories that we've seen before. Um, Here's looking at you, doll. They did well, <laughs> something close to that. I mean, there was a line where Chris Rock was like, so what's the verdict? And the other cop next was like, see for yourself as they like go towards like a dead body or something. And you know, as he flicks his cigarette. Exactly. And you're like, you, you, I've seen this in, before. Yeah. Like in you a, don't in a crime scene. <laughs> you can be in the vein of seven, but you don't have to say what they said in seven. What's in you the know? box? <laughs> um, so yeah. And this movie just really needed a few tweaks to the script. Uh, maybe give them a director that is better suited for helping actors out a bit better. And then you really could have had a good, movie with this but i think whether you're a saw fan or not i don't think people are 
really going to be in, enjoying this one very much. No, I think we saw that in the grosses. Yeah. I was actually kind of disappointed because I was really kind of high on this movie. I thought that yeah, it was going to be a shakeup of the Saw. I thought it was kind of a bit of Saw in appearance, but not really. Yeah. And maybe like a facade of Saw on it. Just facade. Facade. <laughs> Pun intended. <laughs> Nailed it. And I, I'm wondering if, um, obviously it has all those weaknesses you just stated, but is it timing too with all the political stuff going on with cops right now? Do you think that maybe turned off some of the audience? It could have been. I mean, I never really saw in the marketing that that was an angle uh, throughout the movie it, mm-hmm. it, they didn't pitch it in that way in right. the trailers as well i was trying to say that's probably but yeah. and that was probably the right call but i've been I, I think no matter what when it comes to like cop stories like it's probably not a good time to do them right now well i like no how... matter what they're about yeah well you said chris rock struggled with how was samuel l jackson <laughs> uh he was samuel l jackson <laughs> as the role of dad so yeah he was fine um which is sad that that's all i have for it are you still laughing at that pun cody (laughs) i'm trying to be get serious i was asking a serious film related question okay sorry okay (laughs) okay are we good now focus my other thought on it was was that i i went into it when i was booking it thinking that because it had the facade of Saw, that it was really, it's going to be its own story. I mean, it was, it was titled Spiral. It had new actors. It was mm-hmm. an angle. I thought it was just like a flavoring of Saw in it. But then as we got closer, um, I feel like Lionsgate detoured and doubled down on the Saw thing. And I don't know if that is what was going to sell audiences. I think the franchise needed to be different and shaken up. It needed to feel that nostalgic, like... I've kind of seen this before, but this is so different. This is a way different take on what you could do at the Saw movie. And it just sounded like they played it too safe, stuck to the kind of Saw formula rather than breaking that mold. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's a good way to describe it. I mean, in this movie, I don't, I think when it comes to like the Saw elements, uh, you know, the traps, the gore, Mm -hmm. um, the parts that Saw fans really like about these movies, I think they were done, they were probably done less as compared to other movies, but I thought they were done well when it came to the timing of this story. It, it, does that make sense? Like yeah. they were done, there was very minimal of it as compared to other movies probably, but I think they were done for the sake of the story in that way. And that was good. That at least felt okay. good to me. And if, and it was enough to where you're reminded, Hey, this is uh taking place in the saw universe but we still want to switch up uh how these types of movies are going to be moving forward and i i think the marketing team probably butchered it just a bit by really trying to push heavy into saying spiral colon saw if you said from the book of saw it it would have been a bit more relaxed i guess it feels like it would have been like how conjuring has created a universe so is um what was it like the doll movie with annabelle Annabelle, the annabelle movies yeah Yeah. but there it's like a conjuring universe movie but they were standalone their own thing yeah this should have been standalone its own thing within some of the traps of the universe and the lore there sure i think i think that would have been fine i mean this movie definitely doesn't need to be a saw movie like it's fine that it is a saw movie and it makes sense for it to be a saw movie but it doesn't hinge on it being a saw movie like it yeah. doesn't it doesn't matter who the jigsaw killer ends up being and it's not like it's totally connected to past uh, saw movies it's just a good way to switch things up within a franchise that has similar elements to what was done before hmm. well we can agree that the strength in the the first one and the first two was the writing and the surprises like that was the difference between this and any other horror movie like it was different enough that it was special enough in the script sure it sounded like this got close but didn't have all the personifications of a saw film i just think i just think what hurts it as well is that there's eight of these movies this is the ninth movie i think no matter what i bet you if this was like the fifth or sixth movie this could have been 
It could have been better Shut your mouth. F9. Shut your mouth. We have an F9 coming out. <laughs> I think we, it's the it does tenth. not make it stale at all no, in a series. No, honestly. Vin Diesel is not older than crap. F9, <laughs> F9 is a different exception because starting with the fourth movie, they got better. But here, there's just been so many of these Saw movies and they each probably got worse and worse. Maybe with the yeah. exception of like one random one or something. But yeah. they, they just have been... I think a bit played out. Like for me, uh, yeah. the Saw elements of this movie were, but I also haven't seen a Saw movie. I bet you if I talked to a Saw fan, they probably would have been like, it's cool, but I saw this in Saw, I don't know, 4 or Saw Resurrection. That's probably a Saw movie, right? So It's going to be the next one. <laughs> it probably will. So there you go. I got your next title. Yeah. Son. F9 is fine. Son. <laughs> the re the recutting <laughs> the official reboot forget about that well, last one <laughs> it it ended up doing better i think lions gate did a better job at marketing it um it did the having the saw name did help it out yeah for but sure i think the one that struggled was those who wish me dead i noticed that in a lot of areas where i thought it would do better than saw it didn't it just didn't perform and yeah. i don't know if that's because I, I haven't seen it but i don't know if that's because Angelina Jolie is just not draw. I, we were talking in the office. I don't even know what the last movie where she acted in it that I saw. Yeah, I don't remember either. This is, it was by far the lowest of the ultra wide releases we've had. Yeah. Since reopening. Right. Since, right. since unhinged. Yeah. <laughs> like <laughs> by far the lowest. Which is that, which that's saying something. That's saying something when there was 20% of theaters in the U.S. open for that. Yeah. Right. That's a that's kind of a and, problem. And if you put those two side by side and said, Russell Crowe or Angelina Jolie, R-rated movie, mm-hmm. you would think Angelina Jolie would be Probably heads and tails it. above him. Yeah. Just in general. Sure. Like, but she it, she's, not, she's not what she used to be. A Maleficent, I think, was the last thing I saw her in, where she acted. Oh, the, oh the, no. There was a sequel, right? Was, yeah. Yeah, but I didn't watch the sequel. It's Disney. She oh, didn't gosh, act she in saw it. The she first. Just, I know. Her horns did the talking, if I remember right, from That's the right. previews. <laughs> I know, but I think that was... And how old is that now? And Five plus years yeah, ago? I don't know. I just From the first one? Yeah, like seven And then as far now. as an adult film, <laughs> I don't know when the last adult movie I saw her in. Yeah, I can't think of it either. I mean, she's been directing for a while and recently, I guess. But yeah, I can't even think of the last movie she's been in, which was kind of funny because when I saw Those Who Wish Me Dead and I saw her perform in this movie, like a light bulb clicked into my head where I was like, oh, yeah, she's an actor and she's good. <laughs> she's good. Like she can do a good job. I, I So it's just between not seeing her for so long and Honestly, mm-hmm. like I just have seen her more in like you know magazine covers where they're like, "Can you believe she and Brad Pitt did this thing?" And right, it, and I'm like, I I don't care. Like I don't care about you, Angelina Jolie. But honestly, in this movie, I thought she did a good job. Um, How was the movie? Like besides that, I did talk to um, uh, one of the clients that is a firefighter mm-hmm. and and they said it, they did a pretty good job of trying to recreate what the intensity of a fire is like yeah of course they like go crazy in some scenes like hollywood crazy where it's he's like you wouldn't be able to get that close to the fire you would burn your, melt your face off yeah but he said otherwise they did pretty good and that he was pleasantly surprised by some of the accurate feeling that he got from that yeah i think my well, well first i'll just uh quickly explain what yeah. those who wish me dead is uh angel angelina jolie is a uh, smoke jumper working in the forests of Montana. And she kind of is having PTSD after experiencing, um, after experiencing uh, having some people dead on her watch when she was trying to put out a fire with her um, firefighting squad. And so yeah, her crew. And so she's trying to overcome that PTSD by avoiding working in the midst of all the fires and it's just up in the, like the towers uh just doing the scouting and you know she's just trying to recover from that experience but then she comes across a boy who's getting hunted down by uh two assassins as um they try to uncover a piece of information that he has from his uh father who is now dead from the assassins 
Oh, so she has to protect and save this little boy who has who is being chased by assassins, yep. and the assassins start a wildfire, correct, to flush him out. Yep. Yeah. So she's getting chased by those two, and there's a fire fire or a forest fire in the midst of everything. Yeah. And honestly, by that description, I kind of get why people didn't go see this movie. I mean, it is a good movie. I enjoyed it, but uh, the I just think it's kind of what we've been saying on repeat that these R-rated titles with dark subject matter kind of like this, Mm -hmm. it's not appealing to people. And I think when they saw the trailers, they probably thought that it looked like a good movie. They just didn't feel the need to really go out and see it. And with it being on HBO Max, anybody that really wanted to but didn't want to spend the money on the theatrical experience probably watched it. This might have been... I felt like this one... And maybe a little, uh, not spiral because it was theater exclusive, but this, those who wish me dead suffered from the day and dating. It, the grossest suffered from it. Yeah. It was not high on people's priority list. And the, and therefore it kind of teetered on that line of like, well, it's just kind of easier to stay home and watch it on HBO max for free than it is. I, I do wonder, I do wonder what the HBO max numbers are for this. I almost wonder if they, are like the lowest for a new release from Warner Bros. Like the general interest in this movie just wasn't there. I almost wonder, which is kind of interesting because the writer and director of this movie is Taylor Sheridan, who is the creator of the show Yellowstone, which is Mm -hmm. like the, one of the big shows around right now. And Hell or High Water and Wind River. Which are great movies. Like I I love this guy's work. Still need to see his show though, but I thought that could at least get some people's interest, uh, to the theater and get a better turnout Uh, not a huge turnout but a better turnout than what we saw for theaters Mm -hmm. but after seeing the results from this i almost wonder if even though this is from the creator of yellowstone i wonder if people still didn't really bother to see this on streaming either Hmm. and it's not a bad movie i mean i had i I liked his directing of you know all the firefighting stuff the forest fires the action the um the more intense scenes between characters like the directing on it was good but when it came to Sheridan's writing and he's a really good writer I felt like this was probably his weakest outing um and funny enough Jolie um and the young boy I'm based on his name now they both do a really good job as like the main leads but somehow this movie keeps avoiding them from being the leads they always keep going back to side characters to keep the movie uh to have the movie keep going forward and to kind of give them a bit more um characterization to them which is fine, but I think it was costly to those main characters as well. So anyway, it, it's not a, a perfect movie, but I did think it was good, and I thought it would have a better turnout. But seeing what the type of movie it is and seeing the results, it doesn't surprise me all that much. I was a little disappointed when I saw the grosses. Yeah, I, I as was had I. expected to hold it three, maybe four weeks, and I don't know if I can hold it past two we now can barely hold the two weeks yeah yeah <laughs> i mean it was rough i had mm-hmm. some pretty low openings in western states I, I thought that it would play better in western states mm-hmm. than it did and and that was like I, I can see east coast you know like the new england area being like we don't have real forests here <laughs> like why would i care about forest fires like it's yeah. just subject matter doesn't always translate across the country totally but, anywhere with palm trees yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> why do they care like it just i don't know I, I was a little disappointed but that's okay we're moving on it's about momentum at this point right yeah exactly so what do we got so that yeah you had a couple of films are you going to see anything this week? Are you going to go see Dream Horse or uh, I, well, Finding I've already, You? Horse, horse Dreams? I've horse, already seen Dream Horse. I just think Horse Dreams is something else. I don't know if you want to see that. <laughs> We're not going to get into what it could be. Yeah. Uh, I've already seen... <laughs> Focus, okay, Cody. Sorry. Focus. Focus. Uh, I don't know. If there's something new, I'll go try and check it out. But um, I might just be getting prepared for A Quiet Place 2 and Cruella at this oh, point. Oh, yeah. Save your money. Go see those. Sure. All right. So we have um, in the news, the big news this week was Warner Media is merging with Discovery to kind of form this new media company. So AT&T is divesting itself of Warner Brothers, the film studio, the and um, the TV part of it, all the media part. And they've entered into a partnership with Discovery Networks to create this new media company. And 
there's there's been a lot kind of speculated and written about it, and I'm sure that we'll have a firmer understanding of what this means moving forward. My initial reaction is kind of like it. I mean, it, they're becoming a, another corporation, so I don't think that that's going to change corporate structure or policy at the studio too much. I'm. I think it might be good for Warner Brothers, the film studio moving forward, because I think that AT&T didn't know how to treat it very well, didn't understand Hollywood, didn't understand that we're a business of relationships and, and even on the booking level that that holds true. I can't even imagine how much more important that is on the creative side of things. Um, and they just kind of came in and bulldozed a lot of that and almost, I feel took sullied a, a huge huge historic studio that was always a really good partner. Now, I say that because those were sentiments before the pandemic. Like, I did not like the direction that Warner's was going before the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, like, surprisingly, Warner's became our best partner. And they put out product. And they put out product at great terms. And, yeah, I went day and date with HBO Max. But they didn't put up a fuss with the locations we were booking at it and they weren't too difficult on, you know, Be- payments and stuff. Before we even had new movies, yeah. they had steeply discounted classic titles. Oh my gosh, I yeah. And it was And they had that their full library went open too and they put together There were no there were no fathom events blocking things out. Yeah. It was, what can we do for you? Yeah. Right. Wow. And, <laughs> and they made it easy to book and it was just <sighs> Before before that had happened, though, they had laid off quite a few people, and we were wondering, like, are these people that we're working with every day going to survive, and what's this meaning, and and what are they going to do with the content because they had really, like, cut a lot of stuff, but and then they stepped up in the pandemic. So now I'm kind of sitting here going, well, I don't know what's going to happen to them. Is Discovery going to treat – they were on a better path treating theaters as partners. Is Discovery going to continue that? I think – my hope is that – because it becomes more of a media company that more traditional, like Hollywood relationship thing that, um, will continue on this way. Cause it's not going to happen for a while. It's going to, we're going to be a year and, but you know what this means, right? What? Warner brothers discovery. We are going to get deadliest catch the movie guys. (laughs) (laughs) It's going to be rated NC 17 just for language. I'm all in. (laughs) I'm in. (laughs) They'll add beeps in for the non swear words because it will be so aggressive. They'll have to do as far as the language goes. I'm so excited. They would have to do screenings of just (laughs) explicit and non explicit. (laughs) Beeps or no beeps. We're only bleeping half of the swear words, and that gets us to an R. Yeah. 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 Oh my gosh. That might open up a lot of fun possibilities on that front with content. Property Brothers, possible the movie. <laughs> I'm I'm already crowdfunding this thing. I've been doing it for twelve years. <laughs> it's finally happening. Uh, d- 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 if I'm getting this correct, so AT and T still owns Warner Media and Warner Bros. Yeah, and they're things. gonna and they're gonna own seventy percent of this new company. So they're, they're right. not getting rid of their asset. They're not like goodbye Warner Discovery Brothers. Discovery isn't the ones that are now owning Warner right. Media. Gotcha. They'll own a part, a portion of the new company, which will include Warner Media. Mm-hmm. And then what I think that does is they will control and take over the operations of this new company and navigate strategy and relationships, which is what AT&T did very poorly. Yes. And then AT&T will continue to use the streaming funnel and provide some more technology and things like that for this new company and um, provide some of the backing of a bigger corporation. And that I think, I think it's a good, a good plan. My only (laughs) reaction though was I felt, I felt kind of bad for, um, is it Jason Keelar, the, the executive, because I had just over the weekend, (laughs) read this Wall Street Journal article about him and it was this like expose and it was talking about how he's like the maverick and coming in and breaking barriers because this system needed to be broken and restructured and all this stuff and they were making him sound so good in this article and I was like, oh, I don't know if I like this guy and then not like a couple days later it was announced that he was out and they were going to form this new company and I couldn't help but to be like, ha ha. Yeah, it was... <laughs> I did not feel bad for that guy. Yeah, so they announced this merger, and then a report came right after that that was saying that this guy is trying to negotiate 
negotiate his way out. And I yeah. think he's trying to get a job at Netflix. I'm not sure. I could be wrong about go, that, but I think go to I Netflix. Read that. You'll enjoy the <laughs> the streaming platform that they have. Yeah. Um. And I don't know. I know nothing about this guy, but. Netflix Get out of would here, be... Jason Keister. <laughs> yeah, it, I think it's... Netflix would be a much better fit for him because that's all would. streaming, and there's like no studio relationships there. Exactly. Yeah, definitely. And if you want something, you can just buy it. You don't even have to negotiate for okay, it. Okay, Kyle. Another thought. You know how we were talking about how the Meg from Warner Brothers was a very good shark movie in yeah. recent years. They now have discovery shark week footage to make a new shark movie yeah i'm sold <laughs> i am this is, this I have, is christmas i haven't been this excited <laughs> since the trailer this, <laughs> the trailer for the marksman right. <laughs> like, <laughs> i mean woo! you have to think conversations are being thought of. i mean just i mean i bet you like discovery plus and hbo max even they're gonna be like what can we do deadliest catch month or shark year or <laughs> what can we do like the content between that and theaters like it it could have potential i suppose and i think the relationship aspect will be a lot better moving forward than what we've seen recently if they can somehow combine shark week and deadliest catch into a feature length film my head will literally explode yeah <laughs> i could see that oh my god if they say theatrical window <laughs> i'm I'm done. I'm, I, just bury me. Yeah. <laughs> I can die happy. <laughs> All right. What else we have? Well, we have Amazon <laughs> on the other side, maybe kind of sniffing around MGM to buy it. Now, MGM has <laughs> kind of put a for sale sign on their studio. They do have United Artists distributing for them, but yeah. they are their own entity. They <laughs> pretty much just have all the James Bond films, although the the family retains some rights to that. The estate Mm -hmm. retains some rights to those, that product. But, um, I don't know. Is this good? I mean, is this, I I think this, you're just going to see a lot more things like this. I wouldn't be surprised if MGM gets sold to one of the streamers in the next one. I wouldn't really be surprised if Lionsgate gets sold. I know pre pandemic Lionsgate was looking to cut costs and become more nimble so they could be sold. And, and now I'm not sure I'm not sure where they're at with that, but I wouldn't be surprised if that they get picked up too. Uh, yeah, when it comes to theatrical releases from N- MGM, if they if Amazon does buy those rights to mm-hmm. MGM and their content, I just hope that they still are wanting to have the theatrical exclusivity to happen. It I, seems like right. Amazon at least is a bit more tolerant of that as compared to other streaming services. Well, for a Previously. while, Amazon had had. Yeah somebody working for them to take bookings yeah that was a a step up from netflix that had nobody for a long time now yeah, netflix team, has right? a person that can book for them but it's so few and far between there's not i wouldn't even call it a team no I, but amazon gave us sound of metal but they yeah. didn't give us coming to america they didn't give right. us uh, without remorse we're not getting tomorrow war Right. We're not getting whatever the other Mark Wahlberg. Yeah, not even in is. select theaters so they could qualify for anything. No. There's just nothing there. It's more of their artsy stuff that they're doing to the three week windows. Um which that does make me a bit nervous. Like if they're only doing it for the, the artsy stuff for awards, obviously, but not for, you know, blockbuster potential franchise level mm-hmm. type movies like Tomorrow War or Coming to America Two, I guess, could be another one as well in that category. It just it does make me uh, pause and feel a bit concerned, but I don't know. I have to think that Amazon could see like, you know, the James Bonds or like the following Creed movies. And if they acquire those, they would know that these we've seen before that they can have people in seats for theaters and that they would still want to maintain that. Maybe there could, there could be so many levels to this deal. Maybe they purchase a studio. They still have United Artists distribute the new stuff but they take the the um, repertory catalog and that's goes on prime and then they have a short window and then it's right to prime and for some of that maybe we'll see it turn more into that but you know you don't know you, yeah we just we have no it's all speculation we, uh-huh. we will have no idea and even if they did sign a deal it still will be a while before we even know we'll get bond this year and then yes. 
Daniel Craig's retired. We don't know if we're going to get another Bond after that. It'll be up to Amazon. will be another Bond. It'll be up to Amazon, I guess, to, de- to ca- decide. To be fair, it could literally be for the initials MGM. Jeff Bezos does not care about anything like <laughs> normal people care about it. Yeah, no, It could be thinking about James Bond, but he's like, I just really want to own the letter M. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would like to copyright the letter M, and this there's has two M's in it. There's no M, <laughs> there's no M in my name, yeah. and I like the letter M. <laughs> <laughs> Jeffrey well, Mezos. Oh, there it is. Uh, they, um, they were talking about about that that uh, Amazon made the price for the studio maybe like nine billion dollars which was crazy and hard of you're like oh my gosh that's so much money but apparently Amazon had been spending that or more on their which is which is a car so, payment for it's, Jeff uh, yeah, Bezos. Yeah. It's pocket change it's pocket change <laughs> right all so, for the letter M <laughs> so it's just I think that's what's so crazy and eye opening about this um, is that these tech companies the the amount of money they have is so unfathomable yeah. like i think nine billion dollars for a historic studio is like the high water mark and then and then you look at you know and that, that's what amazon pay, has paid for basically to just have prime content on prime and it's like nothing content that this is like a slam dunk for them this is like nothing that their operating expenses are like a hundred billion dollars a year he spent more money for his gardener's summer home than he's gonna spend on mgm <laughs> man that's a good gig to have with the gardener yeah. kind of a summer home well i mean jeff bezos has 300 houses yeah. like that guy's busier than a one-legged man in an I ass he, i think he lost <laughs> even if this turns out to be just a waste of time and nothing comes from it and it just was such a bad buy i think it was still cheaper than his divorce <laughs> so he's probably up yeah, on that yeah by 45 <laughs> times <laughs> yeah <laughs> totally oh. cody and i get divorced we have to split the box of oreos that we hide right. in the back of the fridge <laughs> it'll get nasty it'll literally be fighting over crumbs <laughs> all right because we don't have anything else <laughs> All right, is it time for what are we gonna do? Trailers trailer now? time. time Let's trailers. knock out these trailers. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Uh, we we all haven't seen the Dear Evan Hansen trailer yet, so we'll talk about that next week. Um, yeah, but you can check it out on SilverScreenInsider.com. But what we will talk about for trailers is Snake Eyes and Hotel Transylvania Transformania. Okay, yeah. can I talk about Snake Eyes first? Can yes. I just go get ahead? Into get into Snake Eyes. Okay, they've made two gi joe movies right yeah. that yeah. we've seen one with i think i've seen one them. with channing tatum and yep. then the other one with 30 seconds of channing tatum and then dwayne johnson right Correct. they killed him in the first 30 seconds yeah. <laughs> that's right that's why i don't remember what i was like i don't remember what the second so, and it's so funny G. because is. tatum asked for that he was like i don't want to be in this and they're like all right then we'll kill you and he's like perfect i'll do 21 jump straight now yeah i'll do magic so, right now <laughs> so so we have those two movies all right right and those are big dumb action movies but you recognize elements of them do you well i mean i you... don't i'm not familiar enough with gi oh joe my God. i mean you, you well no no one's familiar with gi joe they were action figures in the 80s even i grew up with some gi joe action figures and i didn't know what they were <laughs> okay <laughs> okay but no, no nobody has any point of reference on gi joe but you know there's a a bad guy who's irish and <laughs> and they blow up or they melt the eiffel tower and then the president is not who he says he is yeah and so you get like the action elements and there's people right. in it this is a movie about a character that doesn't have a face in the first two movies because he wears a helmet. <laughs> That's what makes him cool. Yeah. Yeah, but he's actually two different characters in these movies because he looks completely different in the first movie and the second movie. I don't even remember, so I have Oh, no idea. I do. <laughs> okay, I'll trust your judgment. <laughs> he has two completely different costumes. He looks like... What, you can't have a costume change? You can't be like, I feel like no, something different. No, you can if it's a slightly different change, like a red headband to a blue headband. But you can't go off the reservation, and one guy looks like an alien, and the other guy looks like a ninja. <laughs> There's two very different people here. And now they give him a face in the trailer. Henry Golding. Henry Golding's face. Yeah. Whew. Yeah, but why couldn't you? <sighs> it's worthless. I'm I'm over I, this. I like, really like pick... their casting choice. <laughs> It looks cool. You uh, like this? He looks amazing. <laughs> I am actually amazing. I'm actually so excited for action movies. <laughs> no, no, this. Yeah, it would be if it was an action movie. This is. It does look like an action movie. No, no. He looks like he does all of his own stunts too. Okay. They don't blow up 
shit. Okay. Not in, not <laughs> I don't in need the trailer. People, yeah. I don't you don't need, need to blow hand, you don't hand need to hand combat. When you have the pre- surgical precision with that sword, you don't need to blow anything up. Like Tom a brute. Cruise mounted multiple IMAX cameras to a freaking fighter jet. And these guys are like, yeah, we're going to do some hand to hand karate chopping. Get out of here. <laughs> I liked it. Hotel Transylvania. <laughs> Next. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. I liked Henry Golding. I'm very excited about this one. We'll move on. Snake Eyes look cool to me. Sign yeah. Sign me up. Yep. It at least, I don't know, it at least looked different it, compared to some other generic action movies that have come Did and you? gone. So. It looked sure. like a PG Mortal Kombat. It looked terrible. Mortal Kombat was a PG Mortal Kombat. <laughs> yeah, it was. No, they ripped out the guy's spine. Yeah, for about half a second. I like how they split her in half. With the saw hat, that part was cool. I don't even remember that. Kyle, it's his yeah, awesome just... hat, and he flings it, and then it hits the ground. And it becomes like a oh. table saw, and he just in a half. It was scary for Ken, but I enjoyed sure, it. Sure, sure. But anyway, so okay. two out of three of us liked it. It will probably, yeah. it will probably play well. Yeah, it'll be good. <laughs> no it's thanks. Score of two out of three. So what about score of two out of three? <laughs> So what about Hotel Transylvania 4? What do we think I, of that? I was not super excited for this. I was like, oh, not another one of these. And the premise at in the beginning of the trailer where he, where the son-in-law wants to be a monster, I'm just like, oh, are we really revisiting this like dynamic again? <laughs> like, oh, I'm not good enough with in my father-in-law's eyes. Like, I just, I, I don't like that. Obviously, you're fine. You, you gave your father-in-law a grandson. He's super happy and you stayed and... You know, you guys are on the same page. You Can connected. This is true. <laughs> so they're making an a PG animated monster film for children with Adam Sandler attached. Yeah. Ding ding ding! We have saying, a winner. I'm just it saying, doesn't I'm matter really, what the story know, is. But I was not interested. But then, what was the story for the first one? Doesn't matter. Second, doesn't matter. <laughs> Actually, the story of the first one was that plot, I think. Well, yeah, it was, I'm not good enough because I'm human and we hate humans. And then it was like, but I'm in love with your daughter. And then the second one was, we are having a baby and we don't know if we want to live as monsters. And then they decide their true nature is monsters. And the third one was, is I've it, got to find love and I found love with a human. Is it PG animated? It doesn't yeah. need I get, a storyline. Okay. We're getting off topic here about that. <laughs> is Kevin James in it? Let is me, Adam Sandler in it? Let Sold. me finish. <laughs> I'm saying that I wasn't excited at the first, but then when in the trailer, when they did the little spell thing and they turned him to a monster, I'm like, okay. But when the monsters turned to humans, what got me and what kind of sealed the deal for me in this trailer was when the invisible man became visible and he was Nikki. And I thought that was so funny. And I laughed out loud. <laughs> So and he has red hair. I don't know if that if you remember that callback. Like, what's wrong with red hair? I have red hair, and everybody's like, "How would we know?" But he has red hair. Okay, it's good that they remember. So, that. so Cody says, "Watch yeah. a movie because of a one second part of a trailer." <laughs> it got me. Okay, could be, could be funny for the adults. I think it'll be funny. All the monsters turned to too. <laughs> humans, and I liked that part. I thought that was at least clever. Yeah, it's called Grown Ups. <laughs> <laughs> Watch Grown Ups if you want to see all the monsters as humans. <laughs> What are we what are we doing here? This is it's PG animated Adam Sandler. Sold. Yeah, I'm sure it'll be good. Like I think I think both of you guys are right. <laughs> like for the business and for theaters to play an anime movie, yeah, this this will probably do the trick. You know what they should have done? They just should have transitioned when they turned them into humans to the grown ups trailer and not said anything. <laughs> Yeah, no, this is the movie. They're all at the lake house, and Maya Rudolph is mad for some reason. They show the scene of them all peeing in the pool. And Selma Hayek just has her cleavage hanging out, and they're like, <laughs> yeah, I totally get this. Hotel Transylvania 4. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, yeah, yeah, the kids will watch this. Yeah. Yes. Anyways, it looks cute, and I enjoyed the trailer at the end of the trailer when it <sighs> all came together. Thank God she sure. liked it. <sighs> <laughs> It took a wild yes, folks. tangent. I had to wrangle you back into my million, thought. Hundred million dollars. Here we come. God. Yes, folks. It is awkward in here. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what's next? Uh, I hear. Wait, wait until till I do my Invisible Man impression. <laughs> <laughs> then it'll get real awkward. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So we have a, another theater story, right? Speaking we of do. horrors. Yeah. yeah. Speaking <laughs> of horrors. So this came to us. Um, this last week from Mike and it's 
to understand the premise of this story, you have to know that this is very old school. Like the projectors and stuff and the, the technology in this, this is old school, like 19 in the 1970s. So, so silent films? No, not silent the films. The poor guy is like, we get it. I know. But back then, but back then. Thank, thanks for contributing. Mike, please send us some more of your old ass stories, apparently, <laughs> no. like Cody thanks, said. Thanks, I just for wanna... selling, thanks for sending this by he telegraph. Back when, back when the dinosaurs walked the earth. Yeah. <laughs> Mike I worked just, in a movie theater. <laughs> I just have in my mind what old project, what 35 millimeter projection was. And it was a big projector with platters sitting next to it. The, in this story, to understand it, this was before the platters came into being. So you had two projectors side by side. And it was kind of like um, where you there was cues in the film and you would have to switch um the projector on for the next one, load up the first one, put with the reel, and then at the next cue, do the cue marks on it and stuff. So my Mike is in the projection booth. He's training a new guy. Back before electricity was invented. No. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't quite the bulbs that they had back in the day that blew up, but <laughs> it was caught fire. But anyway. Anyways. So he says... Mm. I, he was putting bro cream in his hair and driving a Corvette. Just know that there's two projectors <laughs> side by side. No big platters. I don't right. even know if you can picture this. And never but seen I, a flying machine. But I am one of those geriatric millennials that I, I straddle the divide of 35 millimeter platters set up and new digital. So I yeah. get this. Drink your Ovaltine, kids. Oh, my God. Okay. So then I love he, this bit. <laughs> sorry. I just wanted to make point out that this is back in the day. This is my back in the day. Cody said you're old, Mike, not us. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it goes, in our booth alongside the second projector, there was a slide machine with which we would project things like starts Friday, concessions closing in 10 minutes, etc. on the screen. The switch that turned the machine on was right next to the projector number two's motor switch. One night, I was training Jim, a new projectionist, in the fine art of changeovers. I had given him a very careful instruction on what to do. I was standing by projector number one, watching for the cues. Jim had his hand on the two motor switch, ready to start the two projector at the appropriate mo moment. The first cue flashed on the screen. Jim flipped the switch, and nothing happened. <laughs> I might have to have Ken read the rest, because it I oh am terrible. <laughs> I will start laughing. Oh What's boy. going on, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> could happen. The motor didn't start. I was panicking and thinking maybe we'd blown a fuse. And after a couple of seconds, Jim realized he had turned on the slide machine by mistake. He got the movie going again with only a couple of seconds interruption. I thought everything was fine at that point. All of a sudden, I realized the audience was going crazy with laughter. The floor was absolutely vibrating from people stomping their feet. We weren't playing a comedy, and I, and I miss Q isn't that funny, I thought. But unbeknownst to me, Jim had neglected to turn off the slide projector. At that moment, the theater owner came bursting into the room yelling, turn off that goddamn slide. It was then I looked at the screen. There was a <coughs> romantic scene happening in the movie. And just so happened that the slide we were projecting was <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I was taking that out. <laughs> Oh. Just oh the most gosh. perfect of perfect timings. All of the Mike, happy accidents. Uh, worked at a triple X cinema. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the seventies were a little crazier than I thought they were. <laughs> They're a little free flowing with what kind of films they put in there. I wonder if that gym guy was like, I'm so sorry, or if he was busting a gut too. Oh my no, god. This was back in the day where everybody was apologetic and super nice. Right. And they probably so he was embarrassed. He's probably still embarrassed. Yeah. He read this story out loud, and Jim's hair probably stood up on the back of his neck. Somewhere and he didn't like, submit the story. He's just he's, remembering oh, the flashbacks. He's, he's cringing. Cringe. Oh he's I like, just, oh, my God. I just Remember imagine them smoking up in the booth and then having that play down there. Oh, my God. <laughs> smoking uh, in the yeah. booth? Yeah. It's the seventies. Of course, they were probably smoking in the booth. They were yeah. probably smoking in the theater. No, no, it was it was the projectors. They did that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like that we're getting these though. Like we want to keep oh hearing these gosh. stories too. Coming soon. I first read this t <laughs> t in the email, and I just died laughing in my office. And I was like, I don't know if I'm going to get through this on the podcast. Reading this, you made it through <sighs> barely. I ish ish. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to defer to you gentlemen from now on because I have a bad problem of like 
when we when Ken and I are looking at memes and we read green text funny stories yeah. and stuff, I can't do it without laughing. I just I just get so excited. This are you is... one of those people that tells the joke but they're laughing as they yeah. tell the joke? <laughs> yeah. No, no. She before she gets to the punchline, she bursts out <laughs> laughing about how funny it is. This is the same woman who has trained our children to not laugh at the particularly funny video on America's Funniest Home Videos. They laugh at the idea that a funny video is about to come on. (laughs) By the time the video comes on and the guy gets hit in the nuts by the wiffle ball, they're already rolling on the floor laughing. (laughs) Not having seen the guy get hit in the nuts. Yeah, they just missed it. They just hear the crazy sound effect like, oh my God, he got hit. (laughs) I heard it. Like that was just another great joke to follow up the previous joke. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Except it was the punchline. (laughs) No, the the people that never moved on from like the uh, Mel Brooks movies where it's like, oh my God, the pocket square moved. I have to laugh at that. Uh, oh, so but, this one wasn't as horror story as much as it was just hilarious. But I still, I'm still loving it. Coming though. soon. I'm gonna be. That's gonna be my new motto. <laughs> Coming soon. I, I love say it. that out loud. Maybe not a motto, but <laughs> Kyle, send us out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Off the Break podcast. You can find us on all podcast platforms and over at SilverScreenInsider.com. Where if you're a theater owner or manager needing updated and accurate film information for upcoming releases and marketing materials for them, you can check us out at that website. Oh, yeah. And shout out to Mike for the awesome story. I just I just loved it so much. Yeah. If you want to send us stories to uh, just email us at off the break podcast mm-hmm. at gmail.com. Yeah. We would love to read them out loud on the air. This is so fun. Yeah. You just called yourself Cody coming soon cruise. <laughs> Goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Bye. Bye.